Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Virtual Breakfast. We're certainly glad to have you with us this morning. It's a lovely day in Michigan. If you're a duck or somebody that likes wet weather, well, Jeff will get to that in just a little bit. But as we get started this morning, I want to encourage everyone to please mute yourself during the presentations. This is just a courtesy for our speakers. And also, if you would be kind enough to please sign in with your first and last name, the way to do that is click on the participant list, find your name and hover over the top of it, click more, and then rename yourself using your first and last name. And as always, during the presentations, if you have questions, you can put those into the chat box found at the bottom. We will have an opportunity to answer questions at the end of our presentations and after we provide credits, Everyone will have a chance to have all their questions answered. We want to take lots of time to get that done. And one of the things that I want to encourage everybody to think about is that we have other specialists on with us as well. So if you have any question, feel free to tap it, type it into the chat or when we're done with the presentations to go ahead and even ask us live, which would be fine. MSU Extension takes our uh, demographic information seriously. The collection of this data from program participants is an important and mandated aspect of all of Michigan State University Extension programming. This is voluntary, and the information that you provide will not be used in any way to identify you personally, but rather as an anonymous member that participated in this program. Following the credits, a poll will be provided we ask that you take a moment to either answer the questions in a poll, if you didn't get those done, uh, and do it at that time. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. Well, we're pleased this morning to have uh, my friend and colleague and forage specialist, Dr. Kim Cassida, with us this morning. Kim is a Cracker Jack specialist working in forages and cover crops, and we are certainly pleased to have her here this morning. Kim, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and ask you to share your screen. So if okay. you could do that, we'll go ahead and get started. And welcome so much. Following Kim's presentation, we'll have Jeff Andresen with the weather. I apologize. It's this morning, everyone. I'm being told that I have an, uh, a weak internet connection. So hopefully this is going to work. Um, if not, have patience and I'll sign back in. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, soil fertility. You talked about this last week uh, for row crops, and I'm going to try and give you a few tips on how to deal with our high price situation from the forage perspective. I'm going to be talking primarily about hay fields, uh, whether you're cutting that for dry hay or haylage is about the same from a fertility basis. Um, if anyone has any questions about pastures, I haven't prepared anything directly about that, but I can take questions about that at the end. One of the first things I want to talk about here um, is the importance of knowing how much nutrient you are actually taking off your field in your hay. Uh, this is the really the first thing you need to know in terms of knowing how much you have to replace, uh, because you have to be able to, to calculate that replacement value. So I have put together this chart here, and this is based on actual forage test numbers from the Dairy One Feed Library that's available online. For a pure legume hay or a pure grass hay, and in this case, most likely the pure legume would be alfalfa. We don't grow much clover as a pure stand. Uh, and these are actual four samples that were submitted through their lab. And if you go through and calculate the percentage of soil nutrient in that material and then convert it uh, per ton of dry forage yield, you get these numbers here. So for nitrogen, we are taking off about 70 pounds of nitrogen per ton of legume hay and 50 pounds in a good grass hay. Phosphate, 15 uh, for both legume and grass. Uh, There's about 65 approximately for potash. There's a little more potash coming off in your legume than in your grass. Um, and those are the three big nutrients that we are concerned about right now with the price situation. 
Another one that I do want you to consider, though, because I'm going to talk about it in a minute, is sulfur. Uh, there's not very much sulfur taken off per ton of forage, but plants don't need that much sulfur, and it can still become um, an issue as a, as a deficiency. Now, to find out your specific farm values, if you want to know, okay, these are nice average values from some database, but I want to know what I'm actually taking off on my farm, you can use a forage quality test to get those numbers. So the forage quality test will probably come back, I hope, <laughs> depending on what lab you're sending it to, with an actual number on it for phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and sulfur, uh, because those, those are also nutrients needed by uh, the animals, and so you'll have a result for that. And you can get nitrogen by simply taking your crude protein number on the forage test and dividing that by 6.25, which would give you uh, the percentage nitrogen. Now, you would need to do a little bit of, of conversion on your phosphorus and potassium to get those converted into phosphate or potash. You also need to know how much soil nutrient you're taking off the field each year. Um, and here is those same numbers from the last slide. And in this case, I've converted them to um, pounds of soil nutrient removed per acre, assuming that you had a six ton per acre dry hay yield. And that's a pretty ambitious yield. It's certainly doable here in Michigan. I know a lot of farms don't, don't harvest that much. But again, you should, I hope, have an uh, at least a rough idea of what your yield per acre is on your farm. And you can therefore take those, uh, those values per ton and figure out what you are actually taking off. Now for nitrogen, for legumes, I've put uh, this 421 pounds of nitrogen in uh, for that six ton hay alfalfa yield uh, in italics, because obviously if this is a legume hay, you don't need to provide that nitrogen to the plant. But this might be a helpful number to think about when I talk about nitrogen credits in a few minutes. Now, in the case of grass, all that nitrogen has to come um, external from the grass because they can't fix nitrogen. And with that six ton yield, you, you have an, uh, just under 300 pounds per year that you are removing. Uh, about 90 pounds of phosphate, 400 or 364 pounds of potash. Um, that's a significant amount of potash that needs to be replaced. And typically that potash is one of the most important nutrients that we have to maintain in a forage field because it is essential to allow those plants to survive the winter. So shortchanging them on potash can have repercussions down the road for, um, for winter survival. Now, in the case of the sulfur that I'd mentioned, we have 30 pounds being removed for the legume in this example and 27 for the grass. One thing um, that you can do to help you with these calculations and figuring out where you could save some money on your fertilizer is matching your yields to location in the field if at all possible. Um, and this is where having a forage yield monitor would really help you. Um, I know not everyone has those yet, but some people do. And what these enable you to do is to get that yield potential across your field. As we all know, you might have a field that maybe it's yielding six tons per acre on one side, but the other end is not nearly as good and um, won't be growing as much forage and therefore is not removing as much nutrient. Uh, so those er areas that yield less um, is a place where you could save a little money by instead of fertilizing the whole field at the same rate, you try and match the fertilizer um, to the yield using more of a precision ag type approach. <clears throat> and I think that this is something that a lot of forage growers are just uh, starting to think about. Uh, people who grow row crops are probably well ahead of us uh, on that, uh, but there's definitely advantages to why we might want to do that. Now, there's been a few changes uh, in the new Tri-State Fertilizer Book. You probably talked about these last week, uh, but there's been some changes in just the way we present uh, the idea of buildup versus maintenance. 
So in the case of our hay crop, now we've, uh, we've determined how much nutrient we're removing, and that's our crop removal, all right? That's our maintenance level of fertilizer that we need to replace in order to keep our field basically at the same point, keep it stable. Um, now, if we're below the critical level um, of a particular nutrient, then we can go into this buildup phase where we're trying to improve the background fertility. Now, maybe that's not something that we want to be able or that we want to be focusing on in a year when fertilizer prices are extremely high. Uh, so you need to know where you are on this range. And the only way you can know that is to get a soil test. I know you hear us talk about this all the time, uh, but it's very, very important. Uh, for a forage field, we typically recommend uh, getting a forage test at least every three years. You don't really need to do it more often than that. You can if you want, uh, but at least every three years to be able to track your changes over time. You want to always do it at the same time of year, if at all possible, uh, because the values will change just due to season of year and it helps you keep a a more consistent um, idea of how things are changing if you're always looking at it at the same time. You want to collect separate samples for fields that have different soil types, management, or fertility history. And in the case of forages, we usually recommend that each of those units should not be any bigger than 10 to 15 acres. And that should, uh, the sample for that should be 20 cores if you have a soil probe or an auger, or with a shovel, you can take vertical slices. And that would be one sample for that field. Um, now, there's a bit of controversy right now about what depth uh, forage samples should be taken. Um, we do know that in a forage field where after it's established, you're always applying your, fer your fertility is broadcast, usually. Um, and so you end up with stratification at the surface of the ground. So some people will argue that you should be taking uh, that sample at a more shallow depth of about three to four inches for a perennial forage field. Um, but I'm going to tell you that what you should really do here is you should take the sample to the depth recommended by the particular lab you're intending to use. And the reason for that is that their calculations of how much nutrient you have available in the soil is based on their assumption that you took the sample to the depth that they said. Um, and so you can get misleading results if you took it to a different depth. And I think that this is something as, as researchers, we probably need to take a closer look at this and, uh, and figure out how we can get this uh, a little bit more fine tuned. But for the time being, go with this. You want to make sure that you clean your plant shoots and litter off the sampling sites. Don't just take uh, some of the grass stems and stolons and litter uh, and put that in your sample because that will give you misleading results. Uh, you want to make sure that you mix your cores in a plastic bucket um, that's relatively clean. Don't have soil carryover from the last field that you sample. And you want to try and use the same lab as much as possible. And the reason for this is even though the labs are all using standardized soil testing methodologies, there's always fine differences between labs on exactly how you do that. So if you take exactly the same soil sample, split it in half, send it to two labs, you're probably going to get slightly different numbers. So if you always use the same lab, you're avoiding that variability in your results. I want to ask you to consider something new. Uh, and this is something that's, again, very familiar to people who are um, growing row crops, but we don't see it used that much in hayfield yet. And that's using grid sampling um, for, your, for your soil sampling. So in this example right here on the left, I have a 25 acre field with a sandy soil type. And if you took each one of those 25 acres and did a separate soil test on it, um, on a fine grid, uh, there's some average, I just made these numbers up for an example, but there are some numbers um, for what the potassium uh, level might be. And our optimal potassium is currently set at 100 to 130 parts per million for a forage field. And you can see here, looking across this field, 
that if I took all of those numbers and averaged them, I'd have 97 parts per million potassium, which is going to put it below the optimal. And if you had that big bulk sample, it's going to tell you you need to put a lot of fertilizer on that whole field. But if you look at it uh, on the grid, you can see that four of the acres are actually well above the optimum, so they don't really need any potassium at all. 12 of them are within that optimal range. So the only thing that it needs is replacement of the nutrients that you removed in your hay. And only nine of those acres actually are below optimum and might benefit from some uh, buildup of potash. And that's only about a third of the field. So that's going to be a lot less fertilizer to apply uh, just based on recommendation than if you went with that uh, average across the whole area. And another thing that you want to consider doing when we have um, the prices where they are is maybe you want to put off uh, putting that extra potassium over replacement on the yellow areas um, until the prices come back down, especially areas that are really, really poor. Because one of the things that we know is on areas that are very, very poor, it takes a greater amount of fertilizer to get the same effect than on a, a field that is closer to optimal. So that might not be the best use of your money um, in this particular situation. All right, so now you have, uh, you know how much uh, you need to replace, you know what you have in your soil. Uh, I want to talk just a little bit about a few of the nutrients and, and things that are going to come back in your soil test. And the first thing here is pH. Um, if you haven't got your pH right, uh, you're kind of wasting your time putting other nutrients out there. For our forage crops, our recommended pH for alfalfa is 6.5 to 6.8. Uh, other legumes can go a little bit lower, um, six to six and a half. A few of our perennial grasses can actually tolerate a pH down to 5.5, but they don't thrive there. Um, but this is just, uh, if you don't have your pH where you need to be, and here's our recommended box, you can see that the width of these bands for applied nutrient or the ability of the plant to take up those nutrients is going to be shrinking as you get to the lower pHs. And that means that even when you put the nutrient out there, the plant can't take it out, take it up. So the first thing you have to do is fix the pH. Um, and ideally, you would be doing that six months before you need to put the fertilizer on. I want to say a few words about sulfur. Um, and that's because we, we sometimes have fields that people think are nitrogen deficient, and increasingly we, we see that it might actually be sulfur. And the reason uh, for that, or how you would detect that, is that you have got um, no manure has been applied. There's good sulfur in manure, um, low organic matter, sandy soils, high rainfall. Um, and what you might see in that stand is that the youngest leaves are yellowed not the oldest ones. If it's older leaves, it's nitrogen. If it's young leaves, it could be sulfur. And that the stand looks quite uneven um, the way I, this lower picture is showing it. The best way to measure uh, sulfur is to do plant tissue testing because we don't really have an accurate soil test for sulfur. Um, and you would also be able to use your tissue test for other things such as um, P and K. And you do this just by collecting top six inches of shoot from multiple plants at multiple locations in the field, um, avoiding damaged shoots, and send that off to a testing lab. Um, typically for forages, we would recommend to do that for first cutting for everything except for potassium. First cutting tissue numbers for potassium will be misleading because the plants use the winter to kind of accumulate extra potassium to use. So they may look okay in the first cut, but then they've blown through that storehouse and, and they may be deficient later in the year. <clears throat> now I promised to talk a little bit about nitrogen credits from forage, and we don't really have any new information on this in Michigan. Uh, this is an older chart uh, from, the, uh, from the Michigan fertility booklet. And uh, typically for alfalfa, 
we'll see a nitrogen credit of 40 pounds per of nitrogen plus a number that is the uh, percentage of the stand in that alfalfa stand when it was taken out. This would be for the next crop. Okay. And then we have uh, similar calculations here for clovers, trefoil, and small grains with legumes. Now, if you are trying to assess how much nitrogen credit you're getting from having a mixture of grass and legume in your hay field as it's growing, uh, typically what we find is that if the hay field has 30% or more legume in it by weight, it's unlikely that additional nitrogen fertilizer is going to be cost effective. Um, so while it may make you feel like you're doing something to put the nitrogen on there, probably you're not getting a boost in yield um, that's helping you very much. And then with that in mind, we're gonna just take a few seconds here to talk about uh, manure on forages. This is uh, in general an underutilized resource, uh, but one that people are paying a lot of attention to. Um, this year. So grasses can use all the nutrients in the manure. Uh, the big argument that we get is, well, if I have alfalfa, it doesn't need the nitrogen, so why would I put manure on it? But it does need all the other nutrients that are in the, in the manure, and it will also use the nitrogen. So that nitrogen isn't going to be lost into the environment because alfalfa and clovers are very, very good at scavenging it. And if you give it to them, they will use that instead of making their own. Uh, and that will prevent it from um, becoming a leaching or runoff risk. Uh, we also know that manure gives you a little bit of extra boost to your plant just by boosting soil biology. So you get a better yield impact from it than even you can calculate by just the amount of nutrients you put out there. And a lot of uh, forage growers have animals and they have manure that needs to go somewhere. Uh, and our forage crops offer multiple application opportunities uh, per year. So by all means, in this, in this year of high prices, take advantage of this. But there are a few disadvantages. Uh, this picture illustrates one of them. Uh, if you want to put manure on a forage stand, you want to get out there as soon as you can after a cutting, because if you wait for the new shoots, particularly on alfalfa to be coming up, um, you're going to have significant traffic damage to those new shoots just from the wheel traffic going over. And that's mostly what happened in this field. Um, although we do have some leaf burn and also some fouling of the forage. If you're applying liquid manure, you want to limit that applications to no more than 3,000 3, gallons per acre um, per application um, or 10 tons per acre solids. Uh, make sure that solids are being applied equally without big chunks because you're going to pick up those big chunks the next time you come over the field with your hay equipment and you are going to have manure in your hay. Um, we get questions all the time about whether injecting liquid manure on an alfalfa stand will damage the crowns and that question was actually addressed in Wisconsin. They did some research on it and yes you will damage a few of the crowns uh, but not enough to reduce the yield of the field. So go ahead and do it. A couple other problems you just need to be aware of if you are putting manure on forage is that if that manure came from a herd that was infected with Yoni's disease, that uh, can be transmitted through the manure into other animals that eat that feed, which maybe doesn't matter to you if you're feeding it back to your own animals that had the Yonis to begin with. But if you're selling it, something to consider. Um, you can see increased bacterial counts in haylage, particularly clostridia from manure. Um, it can reduce the palatability of the forage. And manured alfalfa contains more ash. So one way to avoid that is to cut it a little bit higher to avoid picking up that manure. <clears throat> and the last key thing I want to mention is just if you're applying manure, be prepared to handle increased weed pressure because manure invariably will contain some weed seeds and this will help um, spread them around. And that manure nitrogen can also help uh, push, the, uh, push the weed growth. And lastly, we should not apply manure in the last year of an alfalfa stand because what we find there is when you terminate the alfalfa going to the next crop, especially if you're tilling, uh, you may see excessive nutrient loss. And with that, 
I am done talking. And Thank you so much, right Kim. There. Uh, great presentation. We do have a couple uh, questions that have come up. Jeff, go ahead and go to the next slide. So one of the questions that came up uh, just a little bit earlier was uh, from Eric. And it said, Kim, Kurt talked about how fast nutrient test levels will decrease with no fertilizer added for row crops. How does this affect the hay? Uh, that's an excellent question. And in fact, uh, hay actually removes more nutrient from the soil than many of our row crops actually do because you're removing all the biomass and not just a grain and leaving the, the residue or the stover behind. Uh, so hay crops will pull down your soil test levels faster than, than almost any other crop will, uh, particularly for potassium. Uh, because there's quite, as I showed in my slides, there's, you know, quite a lot of potassium being removed. Kim, what about for phosphorus? That's one of the things that we're always concerned about with our water uh, in Michigan. How does, how much does that affect our field levels? Forage crops will pull down phosphorus, but there's actually been a lot of research done thinking, oh, well, you know, we've got fields that are too high in phosphorus, we need to remove some. Um, and hay has been investigated quite a bit as, as being a potential way to do that. And it will, it will pull down phosphorus, but it actually doesn't do it as, as um, rapidly as we might like, because hay doesn't contain a whole lot of phosphorus. Um, you know, the, the amount that's in there is compared to a grain crop is relatively low. So in that case, um, the pull down might be a little bit slower than some other uh, row crops or grains. Kim, one of the questions that I normally get when I have uh, forage producers calling and asking questions is the timing of our potash application. What is the best timing of that application? I like to see potash being put out um, perhaps a bit later than some other things. You can put it out in the spring. Potash can be applied at any time. Um, but if you really want to get that boost from, uh, from the potash for your winter survival, you want to especially make sure that you've got it there going into the winter. So putting it on in the spring is a little too late if, if it was deficient going into the fall before. So that one is one that can quite effectively be uh, be applied in late summer or fall. All right, great. And w one of the things that you brought up today was talking about sulfur. And there's a lot of different types of sulfur available. What is the best form of sulfur that we should apply uh, to get that five pounds for alfalfa or four pounds for our grass? Well, remember that's per ton. That's per ton. Per, so per if ton. you're getting, yeah, it's it's more around thirty pounds, twenty-five to thirty pounds. If you're getting that six-ton yield, again, you have to adjust it according to what your yield is. Um, on our on our forage uh, research, we have been using a lot of gypsum. Um, you know, it's relatively inexpensive, and it's a pretty good source of sulfur. Of course, if you're if you're applying um, to a grass only, you can use ammonium sulfate, but you don't want to pay for that ammonium if you're applying it to alfalfa, which is where we're seeing a lot of the sulfur problems. So um, you need to look at your cost effectiveness for your different sources of sulfur. Um, and that's probably the best answer there. All right. And then I also have a more of a forage slash sometimes cover crop question about triticale. But when we're using triticale for forage, applying nitrogen, how much and when should it be applied for our forage crop? Because it does take more than just a, as a cover crop. Oh, absolutely. If you are growing triticale as a forage crop and you want good yield and, and nice forage quality numbers, you do need to feed it. Uh, and typically we would be putting out half of our nitrogen in um, at planting. And then we would be boosting it with another application in the spring, right about the time it's starting to grow. Do you have amounts that we should be applying? Off the top of my head, I do not. <laughs> but I can get that and uh, so that we can um, 
distribute that to people. All right. I do have a question for Dennis Pennington. Dennis, are you on this morning? Yes, I am. Dennis, we've got a, a question from Bill asking about where we are as far as our wheat stages uh, across the state. What are you seeing? Yeah, so our wheat stages across the state were in a lot of places we're still in the tillering phase, which is speaks to. Um, we are we have greened up on much of the state up into the north. I need to look at some uh, weather data to see if we've actually um, you know come out of dormancy in the northern part of the state. But um, yeah, so we're, we're greened up and starting to grow. We should be approaching Feeks 3, which is the end of tillering. And then uh, soon after that here in the next couple of weeks, especially if we get some of that warmer weather, uh, we'll be approaching Feeks 4 and 5. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, we, it's time to be starting to think about some herbicide applications and, and getting nitrogen on wheat and, and those kind of things. Dennis, speaking about nitrogen, uh, last week, Kurt talked about a split application of nitrogen that many times it does not result in increased yield. I, I also have seen other work uh, done in the thumb area with a split application of nitrogen on wheat. The, it, it was effective uh, to produce a little more yield on especially your sandier soils. What, what have you seen in that situation? Yeah, I've, I've seen both and it really depends on the weather and what your yield goals are and, you know, the timing of when you want to make those applications. The earlier you, you make your first application, the greater risk you have uh, for loss because of uh, rainfall. And so, you know, you got, you always got to keep that in mind. Um, and by splitting, it does give you the option on your second pass to make adjustments to your rates based on, you know, whether you, you think you've lost some or not. And then it gives you a chance also to look at what your crop looks like. And if you think, you know, hey, I, I might have some good yield potential, you might want to bump it a little bit. Or if it's like, ah, oh, this is not looking as great, you can drop that rate back a little bit. If you make one application, you know, once that's done, then you're, you're done. Um, so there is the, the, the two application does give you a little bit of flexibility. And, but Kurt is right. There are times when you get benefit from a split application. Um, and there are times when you don't. Um, All right. So, yep. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, we bet. did have a question for our, our Cracker Jack uh, entomologist, Chris, asking about uh, moths coming from storm fronts and southwesterly winds. What do you think about insects coming north to join us? Is she so, still on? Um, yeah, I'm here. So I've already looked at the Purdue newsletter. I kind of use them as my uh, my guide. And I don't think there was true armyworm found yet, but there was cutworm uh, found in those traps. Um, for those of you who are interested in trapping earlier on, I put the link to the, to the trapping site that we have for the region. It's growing every single year. And we have from Wisconsin all the way across to Maine and all the Canadian provinces. And what we're lacking is some of the states to the south of us. That sure would be great to have them on. But I've already got traps out. I know Eric Anderson already has traps out. And a lot of the extension agents are gearing up to put their cutworm traps out. So we will have some live data. Like next week, we will already have some data for you. Terrific. Kim, I see you put something in the chat. You want to let our friends that are on phones know what you found for the trick. Kaylee? Yeah, I had a chance to uh, ch double check our <laughs> our recommendations while uh, other people were talking. So the fertility recommendation for winter triticale is 50 pounds of nitrogen at planting and 100 pounds in the spring. And if you're putting in spring triticale, we just put on 100 pounds at planting. So would you put that spring application on now? Or is it too? Well, ideally a little earlier than that would have been nice, but with the wet soils um, you want to put it on right about the time that the plant is starting to uh, explode in growth when you're when you start to see that jointing well just like Dennis talked about the wheat is breaking dormancy we are yep. just greening up in the, yep. in the upper thumb right now so yeah I don't uh, think I, it's too late so. uh, I think we're just about right right at the spot so so hopefully you can get on the field without tearing it up <laughs> Okay. Are there any more questions for any of our specialists that we have this morning? 
Jeff, I'm glad to see that it's going to be a little drier, but the cool weather uh, concerns me a little bit as far as having temperatures, <coughs> excuse me, that are, are warm enough to, to get rid of some of the moisture that we have. So we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. Yeah, we hopefully we won't be stuck in any one pattern though for too long. That's the, and I, I get that there will be some some moderation. But the degree days and back to the wheat question, wheat development. Um, northern parts of the state are actually behind in terms of our thermal accumulation. Our degree days, we're we're closer to normal in the far south, maybe even a day or two ahead. But northern parts of the state definitely are are, are lagging at this point behind where they typically are uh, at this time of the year. All right. I don't see or hear any more questions. So I want to say thank you so much to Kim and Jeff for their presentations this morning. Remember that this, uh, this information will be available live, um, not live, I'm sorry, on a recording with also our um, closed caption. So that'll be available later on in our Facebook as well as on our web page. With that, I'm going to stop it for today. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week and enjoy the holiday weekend.